Thank you so much for your patience. Um, so if you have friends who would like to join the session or who would benefit from today's topic, today we're discussing sustainable uh, sustainable fundraising models. And please send them a message. We share the link with them to join um, right now. Um, we'll just take a few ground rules and then we will move um, to our opening address and start the session from now. Um, so please, um, it's a webinar, so there'll be no need to meet your mic. Um, just so we don't need to mute your mic. Um, so um, if you have questions in the chat and you'd like to speak, please raise your hand and then we'd um, allow you to speak if you'd like to verbally ask your questions. Otherwise, please um, type your um, comments or questions in the chat. Um, there'll be polls at um, various times during the session. Please complete them. They help us to uh, know how well we're doing and they help us to know how valuable the session has been to you. Um, as much as you can, avoid multitasking. Um, you want to make the most out of the two hours. I think we're here for about two hours or so. Um, so take notes and uh, don't multitask. Thank you so much. Um, so to open our session officially, I'd like to invite um, our Director of Grants and Programs, Ms. Indy Freke Okwebeman, to come um, open the floor officially. Ms. Indy. Hello everyone. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning from different parts of the world. I'm sure we have people here from, um, I can see that we have people from um, South Africa, we have people from East Africa, we have people from Nigeria, we have people from Rwanda, um, we have people from Kenya. Thank you for making the time to join us today. We deeply appreciate your um, trusting us to impact knowledge um, today through this session. Um, as my colleague Elo said, my name is Indi Freke Okebunam. I'm Director of Grants and Programs here at Aspire Coronation Trust Foundation. Um, and it's a privilege to be hosting you today. Um, one of the reasons why we are hosting this session as a foundation is that in the past five years that we have been supporting nonprofits to improve um, on developmental issues on the continent, we have learned a lot of lessons and we have seen that the specific things that affect nonprofits affect the growth of nonprofits, which in turn affects um, sustainable impact from the projects that we do. And one of it is funding. And funding, we can look at it from different and diverse perspectives. And today we have brought to you experts um, who are going to be sharing and talking to you about how to build, how to create sustainable um, fundraising strategies. They are going to be discussing what you should do to fundraise. What sort of business models should you be looking at that can help your organization be sustainable? A lot of your organizations are doing amazing work, are doing great work, right? And you're changing lives in your communities. But if something were to happen and funding did not come into your organization this year, would you shut down? or would you still be able to continue the work you do? So we are hoping that at the end of this session, there will be learnings, there will be opportunities for you to learn, gather knowledge that can help you build organizational sustainability, and also have strong fundraising strategies that can help you access funding to help you continue the great work you're doing. I'll use this opportunity and tell you a little bit about our foundation for those who do not know who we are or who maybe heard about us for the very first time. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity and tell you about Act Foundation. So we are a grant-making organization, and we were established in 2016. Um, and our, our mandate is to support local, national, and regional non-profit non organizations working to address challenges on the African continent. Um, in that, since, since we were established, we started work in 2017. And at that time, we, we, uh, we started working with non-profits by providing them funding providing capacity building and any sort of sort of support that you require to ensure that the nonprofits thrived even while they were creating impact in their communities. As an organization, our focus areas are health, entrepreneurship, environment, and leadership. So we provide funding across these um, four focus areas. In health, you would observe that we provide funding um, in malaria, cancer, and on, in cancer, we are looking at breast, cervical, and prostate cancers particularly. Um, and then we also fund interventions in maternal and child health. 
In environment, our focus has been vocational education. How do we build skills um, that people can turn into livelihoods and people can use to create businesses that can employ more people so that we can reduce the rate of unemployment um, on the continent. And that area that we fund is um, financial literacy and inclusion. In environment, our focus has been waste management, upcycling, recycling, um, tree planting, waste management generally. Um, how do we protect the environment? How do we, what are the things that we're doing as humans that are destroying our environment? How do we manage our waste so that we do not contribute um, to all the challenges that we're finding? Another area that we fund in environment is water and sanitation. And in leadership, our focus is leadership development. Um, this is quite critical because that we find that is a huge challenge on the continent. And we need more individuals to realize that leadership is not about the title, it's about how how much you're willing to do. What are you what um um what change do you want to see in your community and how are you contributing to make that change happen? So we fund interventions across these four focus areas. Some of the other things we do apart from grant making. And which is what a lot of people would know us about, is host sessions like this. Um, because we believe that it's important that we build capacity in the sector. It's so critical um, that we, we, we are teaching, we are helping people better understand how they can be more effective in program implementation, effective as an organization, so that we can ensure that um, there is sustainable development, that the work that we're doing is impactful and is sustainable. So we offer um, capacity building and trainings um, across the different programs that we do, across the different um, focus areas and across all sorts of issues that we find in the sector. We also um, run a professional volunteer program where we provide support directly to our grantees now, um, and we hope that in the near future we are able to open it up. But where we are partnering with private sector organizations to provide free consulting services to our grantee organization based on their areas of need. So is it in human resource management? Is it in program implementation? Is it in fundraising? Is it in monitoring and evaluation, um, impact assessment? Is it in how to utilize technology? Is it in project management? You have experts who are already in the private sector, well-trained with over 15 years experience, working with you and talking to you about how you can improve on the work you're doing, on the skills that you require to help your organization thrive and be sustainable. Um, another thing that we do um, at the foundation, we host an annual conference, and this is focused on development issues. Um, as a, as a uh, social impact organization, we realize how important it is that to have this conversation so we better understand how um, the private sector, public sector, and social sector can come together to ensure that we create change on the continent. So we host the Breakfast Dialogue every year. Um, we're going to be hosting one this year in September. Um, our foundation is five this year, so we're going to be celebrating our fifth anniversary, and we hope that you'll join us in that celebration. We also host a Change Makers Innovation Challenge, and, and I, I'm sure a few of you here will fall into this category. Um, with the Change Makers Innovation Challenge, we look at organizations who are leveraging technology to create social impacts. Um, and we provide grant funding to the three winners, the three best projects that apply for that, um, for the Change Makers Innovation Challenge. And they use that money to, to scale the work that they're already doing and even create more impact um, on the continent and in their communities. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, with this little brief introduction that I've given you, you know more about us. Uh, please visit our website. Um, there's a lot of research that we have done that you'll find on our website. Um, so you can read about um, some of the, the issues that we're finding um, on the sector and see what the, chat, what the solutions are and how you can learn from it and use that to improve the work that you do. Thank you for the opportunity to um, introduce ACT to you today. Um, I'll hand over back to Elo. Please have a great time. Note down your questions. We have experts that are going to be speaking to us today. Let's take advantage of their knowledge and learn to help us improve our organizations and be more effective in delivering services to um, our constituents and our beneficiaries. Thank you and have a wonderful day.
thank you so much, Ms. Andy, for the introduction. Um, I believe people now understand a bit better at least um, what we do at the foundation. Um, and so we're going right ahead uh, into our session proper. Um, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for today. Um, he is the director and adjunct professor at Center for African Philanthropy and Social, Social Investments. He's a writer, researcher, and thought leader who has championed this course of philanthropy across the continents. He has experience in management, leadership, and strategy. Um, he um, was, responsible, was the director of programs at um, Trust Africa, where he developed strategies to cultivate a conducive investment um, and business environment. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with us um, Dr. Professor Bekin Kwasi Okay. Uh, yes, uh, good morning. I don't know if you can uh, see me and hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can see and hear you. Okay, great. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, can you allow me to share my screen? Okay, please let me know if you can see it. Yes, we can see it. Okay, I will just uh, leave it here for now. Uh, and like I said, thank you very much. I have uh, been requested to talk to you about uh, a couple of issues, uh, especially around what I see to be emerging sustainable funding models for civil society organizations in Africa. And thank you very much, ACT Foundation, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for doing this for the civil society sector. I also want to thank my brother and colleague, uh, Tapesaki, uh, who will be speaking later. Uh, as I know, our presentations are likely to overlap. Uh, but I thought I would start um, uh, by talking to you about my experience uh, leading uh, civil society organizations in the continent. Uh, way back in 2013, I, uh, I was yet handed to uh, lead the South Africa Trust in uh, South Africa, which is a regional institution uh, focusing on the eradication of poverty and inequality. As soon as I joined, uh, I discovered that the main donor at the time was a bilateral institution. Uh, they had set up the organization. Uh, they had funded it from inception until the time that I joined. But immediately as I joined, uh, there was a succession going on. Uh, I was taking over the founding director. And in the first meeting that I had with the donor, I was told that the donor's funding was going to come to an end. And that was a big shock to me and to the system because I had not imagined that my first task would be to deal with either closing an organization or changing it. So we were faced with two options. Or let, let me say I was faced with two options, either to close the organization because there will be no funding going forward from the donor who had actually provided us with core funding or change the organization with the hope that we could pivot to new ways of working, new ways of sustainable funding. Uh, but also, obviously, it, that would be a difficult task for us to do. So we chose to, to change. Uh, and choosing to change entailed that we have to restructure, um, we have to cannibalize ourselves in one form or the other, but it also entailed a lot of change management strategies. We were too big uh, for the short runway that we had. Uh, and this, I'm using the analogy of the runway and the aircraft so that you can understand the challenges that we're facing. If you are a big aircraft, you need a very long and big runway to take off. Uh, and that's the case that I found um, with the Southern Africa Trust when I joined. It was a big organization. It had several partners across the continent. It had a huge staff component, but there was limited resources because the donor wanted to pull out. And so that meant the aircraft was too, was too big for the runway. And so you either change the aircraft or you change the runway. And in this case, it was not possible to change the runway. We had to change the aircraft. And changing the aircraft meant that we have to, we have to uh, make ourselves smaller. We have to make ourselves light so that we are able to utilize the short runway that we had. And the runway here refers to the limited funding that we had just received. 
So I'm starting there because I want to go over some of the points that I'm picking up, but I want to tell you what we then did because then my presentation in terms of some of the theoretical stuff and some of the models that I'm talking about will make sense. So we changed the aircraft and we pivoted. And changing the aircraft meant that we adopted social entrepreneurship approaches to our work. That meant we had to look at ourselves and ask the question, who are we, what do we do? Is this still real or not? Clearly, we were a grant making organization. We had made grants across the region. That meant we had developed expertise in due diligence. We had developed expertise in capacity assessments, capacity building, financial management, reporting, and so forth and so on. And it appeared to me then that if we were to pivot to a new institution, a lighter aircraft, we needed to think about this function on grant making and change it. And so we moved from being a grant maker to a fund manager. So that shift from grant making to fund management entailed that we were now going to charge commercial fees for what we were doing. Previously in grant making, we were donor funded. And if we moved to fund management, it meant that we are going to charge commercial fees for whatever we we're doing. So that was number one shift that we did. But second, it meant that we had to sell our skills. We had to sell our skills and our expertise. Previously, our skills were funded by a donor and we were not supposed to sell it. But in this case, we had to sell our skills. And thirdly, it meant that we had to look at the team at that point in time and ascertain whether we had the right team with the right expertise for the new role and the new shape and the new organization that we had created. So we had to go out into the market to look for new expertise, to look for new skills. Another shift that we did was we decided we were going to monetize all our products as long as it was within the guidelines and within the provisions of our donor agreements. We we're going to monetize all our products. But to do so, we needed to create a vehicle that will allow us to do so legally and within the provisions of our, um, of our mandate. And so we have to think about creating a business development arm, but also to create a resource mobilization strategy. Within that, we monetized our research products, we monetized our capacity building program, we monetized our due diligence uh, exercises, we monetized our assessments, we monetized our financial management. And that meant that our strategy had to capture that such that our partners are not confused by who we're becoming. And then thirdly, we had to move away from renting our office space to owning our office space. And here was the challenge. And I think most nonprofit organizations are going to find this very uh, common way to resonate. When I went to all the donors, especially our donor, the bilateral donor that was funding us, and asked that they help us buy a building, they all said, no, our policies don't allow us to buy a building. But I said, your policies allow us to rent. They said, yes. And I said, but the amount of money we are spending on rentals is equivalent to us actually paying monthly to own a building and they couldn't move, they couldn't budge. Luckily, one of our donors that happened to be progressive gave us the money and we used a part of our savings to actually buy two buildings. And then we turned those two buildings into uh, an office space, but that office space that entailed what sitting, uh, but it had huge conference facilities. We also just started out renting out space to other institutions, private sector companies, and others who needed the space. So we calculated how much we would save from buying buildings and owning them and making money out of them, as opposed to going to donors and asking them to fund the renters. I've started here because I wanted to give you a sense of what's happening out there, and then I will, I will, I will explain some of these models. I've already given you one way in which you can uh, start thinking about uh, moving away from the current setup to finding more innovative uh, solutions. But what's happening out there in the world 
I think one of the things that I wanted to do, and I'm not going to go through everything here, was to really show you what's happening in the world of systems in terms of uh, the donor uh, trends, but also give you some options around what civil society organizations ought to be doing in order to sustain themselves into the future. So I'm not going to do everything, but I just wanted to give you one sense. So one of the things that is happening globally is the increasing um, attention on philanthropy, especially the role that it plays uh, in policy making and the achievement of the 2030 development goals. Uh, previously, philanthropy was known to, in, I mean, to intervene, but it wasn't really at the center of policy making. It wasn't at the center of global development. And we see uh, right now the role that philanthropy is playing. And we see a lot of countries beginning to put in place platforms that allow themselves and their formations, including civil society, to create partnerships with philanthropic organizations. So philanthropy is one of the biggest forces that civil society anywhere in Africa ought to be thinking about, ought to be finding ways in which it can tap into the different forms of philanthropy and create partnerships and other investment models that it can get from philanthropy. So there's a big focus on philanthropy and I think going into the future, given what's going on in terms of the overseas development assistance, but the general aid that used to come from um, the global north to African uh, uh, countries, there's going to be a huge competition for local resources uh, by both governments and uh, civil society organizations. But civil society organizations have an edge, and I'm using this so that we begin to think about how we can uh, build sustainable relations with philanthropy. The second trend is that uh, a lot of countries, like I said, are beginning to put in place either departments or uh, units within their governments to create a working relationship with philanthropy. This is either ad hoc or formalized. And why is this important? This is important because the more government court philanthropic organizations, the more they do work that is cutting edge, that is innovative, but that is also risk, risk taking. And the more they, the citizens are going to begin to see what governments are capable of, because we have already established that philanthropy does most of the risk uh, taking work. They do most of these innovations and it's only the scaling up element that they may not be able to do. But with their partnership with governments, they are able to then scale up. Here is the opportunity for civil society to sustain in its interventions. And I'm, I'm using the word sustain because Sustainability is beyond the organization. Sustainability is also about the interventions that an organization makes. An organization might make an intervention today and only have its impact 20, 30 years down the line. That's sustainability. That organization may not be in place at that point in time, but its interventions might still be in place and that's sustainability. Here is the opportunity for a a, 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 a trend of success that's been created by the current setup where philanthropy governments and civil society need to come together to solve the challenges of the continent. And there's no better sustainable option for civil society than to partner with other sectors in the economy, uh, in politics and so forth and so on in, in a country regionally and globally. So this idea of partnerships from a triangular perspective is one way in which we can begin thinking about sustainability beyond finances, sustainability in terms of environment, sustainability in terms of politics and so forth and so on. So I think that we are being given an opportunity here by these governments that are setting up these platforms and the philanthropic organizations that have partnered with the United Nations and others in the implementation of SDGs to actually establish this, this platform. Civil society has to take advantage of that. Only then will its skills, its scale, and its experience be enhanced such that when they pivot to new ways of working, they are already capacitated. And we know capacity is one of the biggest issues that we're struggling with in the civil society sector. So again, as you can see, uh, the global trends in terms of 
how money flows tell us where global giving, especially by philanthropic organization goes. Uh, this is an outdated study in 2018, but I'm sure uh, the trends have not changed that much. We can see that globally, uh, out of the 24 billion that uh, was, was going around in 2018, the main areas that this money went to were health and population. And then the other areas that were supported were education, agriculture, civil society, and others. This is the similar trend, even if you look at in Africa, they tend to support issues like health and education, and others tend to go down the list. And so civil society does get support, but it's not support that you can say is adequate. So civil society already suffering from lack of funding, as you can see from this uh, table. Uh, the rest of what I have here, and I'll share this presentation, is just global figure is in Nigeria, is in Kenya, and so forth and so on. And you can, you can see, again, the trends are the same. Funding is going to health, funding is going to uh, education, and really goes to other areas as well. Uh, that's still a graphical representation of what I've just said. I'm not going to, uh, to, to spend time in that. Uh, but what I think I wanted to, to, to raise here is that foundations in all African countries are a good source of funding for civil society. We have a variety of foundations, corporate foundations, family foundations, international foundations, and so forth and so on. All of them fund one element or the other which civil society is working on. The challenge that civil society has always had is to make itself um, attractive to these foundations. Civil society has always benefited from international funds, but very little uh, of civil society across the continent manages to make itself funded by local foundations. And I think that's one area where we need to think about strategies to make civil society partner, collaborate, but also be in a position to sell itself to some of these foundations and the local forms of support. Because we have no choice but to think about domestic resource mobilization for sustaining the work of civil society. So there will be one element of civil society that will still depend on traditional grants. And foundations offer that opportunity for grants to continue underwriting some of these new business ventures and business models that we would want civil society to actually do but grant making will still have to play that role. And so that's the point that I'm making here about the need to continually scope foundations in the areas of that we operate in, uh, develop uh, partnerships, uh, forge networks, uh, but also make ourselves attractive. We should almost think like we are selling a product. What product are we selling to these foundations? Is our product bankable? Is our product attractive is it better than other products in the market. If we don't think like that, then we'll be forever competing and losing. countries, uh, you, can, you can take some time after the session to, uh, to, to actually look at this. This is really the amount of high net worth individuals and, the, and what they hold in the different countries, uh, especially Kenya and others. And again, the trend there, as you can see, is education and end. And, 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 and. Uh, so the second area, in addition to is that civil society might find ways of, uh, of, 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 of working with is this whole new phenomenon of high net worth individuals. Uh, Nigeria and parts of West Africa, you are familiar with some of the uh, high net worth individuals, some of whom have gone on to set up their own foundations. Uh, you are familiar with the Dangote Foundation, with the Tony Elumelu Foundation, 
um, and, and so forth and so on. But there are, there are several others across the, the nation, across the region, across Africa. Some of them have no foundations, but they are finding ways through which they can uh, give back to their communities. We need to know how do they give back? What are their interests? What instruments do they have? Uh, so that we are not forever thinking that they can only work with civil society through a financial through civil society with. The majority of them prefer direct uh, uh, financing. Others prefer collaborations uh, and so forth and so on. So rather than thinking of a grant making instrument, let's look at other options uh, through which these high net worth individuals are likely to work with civil society. The reality is that in the next couple of years, the population of high net worth individuals in Africa is going to surpass other regions uh, that currently are leading. So it is a, a force to reckon with, and we need to figure out ways in which high net worth individuals can to support This issue of finite with individuals is a very important component that I think maybe my colleague Dapesaki might come back to when he talks about some of the fundraising uh, strategies. Uh, that's still you know, the figures that tell you about finite with individuals in terms of the amounts, where they are found, the cities where you can find them in the countries and their population. You can get this uh, through the new updated report in 2020 and 2021 that gives new figures. But there's not much of the difference really in terms of the location, the size, and the numbers. You still, the trend is still the same. You can find them in some of these cities and these are the amounts. Um, quickly, I wanted to you know, go to one of the things that uh, I thought is useful here. Uh, obviously, some of the trends that you might want to look at is, you know, can civil society also approach bilateral donors? Can, can, can it work with, uh, you know, multilateral donors and so forth and so on? What are the, you know, the, the, the different strategies that you might want to engage in? For big civil society organizations that have the capacity to engage bilateral and multilateral donors, one of the biggest uh, barrier is capacity. Uh, because these donors really, really require a lot uh, from you in terms of management, in terms of reporting, but they also want to make sure that all your systems are credible, they are strong. So one of the things that if you are a big civil society organization and you want to engage these bilateral donors, you need to do what is called a pillar assessment. A pillar assessment is, 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 a, is, a, is some kind of due diligence that is conducted by some of these uh, uh, companies like EY and others, and they make sure that all your systems, whether it's governance, finance, uh, administration, grant making, if you're a grant maker, are strong and effective to manage huge grants. And that's not for every civil society organization, I must say. Only a few organizations are able to do that, and they must have the muscle to actually do it. Uh, going for bilateral and, and, and multilateral funding for civil society organizations at times is counterproductive, but I leave it as an option because some of the projects might actually benefit from that, especially if you adopt attitude or the approach of fund management as opposed to just implementing on behalf of. Uh, so I'm also putting that as one of the strategies uh, that you can begin thinking about putting in place and building sustainable forms of financing uh, beyond that. Now, here is where I think you know uh, some of the some of the civil society organizations might start beginning to think about pivoting towards. So the first is 
there's a lot that is happening in the corporate sector uh, in terms of corporate social investment and responsibility. Uh, and in countries like South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, and uh, Kenya, where the economy is thriving very well, uh, they, there's been a mushrooming of uh, these uh, social investment programs that are available for civil society to tap into. And the, 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 the challenge there is obviously making civil society work um, attractive, but also making it very relevant uh, for the communities in which they are located, but also for the companies that are operating within those communities. Com corporate, the corporate sector or companies, if you take a mining company in one community, one of the key concerns that it has is to maintain its social license to operate. And the only way it can maintain its social license to operate is making sure that it has a good corporate image. And the good corporate image means that they have to work very uh, closely with civil society, with the trade unions, and other forms of expressions in that community. And civil society has a role here to become the, uh, the platform, the negotiator between the companies and the communities so that both uh, communities and companies are doing the right thing. And this is where a lot of companies would then look for civil society organization and finance them to do their work on behalf of the corporate. And so I think looking into uh, and pivoting into different forms of social investment for civil society is one way in which you can broaden and diversify your sources of income. And that is not that also includes other forms of social investment. They're not just the money. There are other uh, forms that you can get. Companies do volunteer programs. Um, if you are a civil society that requires skills in financing and technology, you can actually partner with most of these companies so that some of their key experienced staff members can donate part of their time, their skills to your organization. And you register in some of these companies through their portals to actually get that assistance. Secondly, you might need in-kind donations such as computers, data, uh, buildings, and so forth and so on. These corporates have the possibility and the opportunity to do that for you as a civil society organization. So again, there are so many resources that exist in the corporate world that we can tap into. And the corporate world has already made a decision that it wants to be a corporate citizen. They've all en 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 embraced this idea of shared value. So what does that mean? Can we unpack that for the benefit of civil society? The other part is, this is not happening as much as we would want to see it, but our research is telling us that there's a beginning of some thinking around companies, especially those that are run by uh, the second, third and generation of, of, of wealth people who, who are offering civil society organizations more than money, and they are offering them percentages in companies for shareholding. What does that do? It means that there's continuity in dividends, but it also means that the civil society organization that, has, that owns shares in a company actually has more than money. It has the power to uh, influence decisions. It has power to influence where that company uh, goes to do business and how it does business. And so that's even more uh, you know, sustainable format than just getting the money and letting go. You get the money, but you are also involved in shaping how the social justice concerns of the community are met by that company or those companies. So can we get a group or many organizations that could go into this mode of shareholding in companies so that they can influence the thinking, especially in extractive industries uh, and other forms where we know civil society wants to change the global concerns and reform them. There's, I've already spoken to issues of volunteers. Volunteers are a source of huge, 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 huge forms of support to civil society. And I think we have not done a lot in terms of tapping into what exists in volunteering programs. Tax advantages, I know that different countries are struggling with the issue of tax advantages, but we need to lobby for very conducive tax advantages for civil society, but also for philanthropy to actually happen. So such that when companies give to civil society, 
they actually benefit such that when individuals give to civil society, they also benefit. And this also helps in fundraising because when you fundraise, you know when is the right time to fundraise. And one of the ways to determine what is the right time is the tax considerations. Are there tax benefits if I'm to go to this company, to go to, to this individual? And as, an, as a civil society organization, you have to make yourself um, you have to make yourself eligible for tax brackets. In other words, you must become what we call a public benefit organization. Only then are you able to issue a donation certificate to those that give you support. If you are not, then think of a fiscal sponsorship or arrangement with those that have got that facility. Because a lot of people would want to give, but they want to give in such a way that they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they can file and get something back uh, during the time when they file their taxes. So having that facility of um, you know, being a public benefit organization is, a, is an advantage. And very few organizations have actually taken advantage of that, especially in countries where the tax environment allows for that. Uh, there's a lot that's happening right now in the impact investing world. And I think that um, uh, you, you are better placed to even talk about this as ACT Foundation and some of your partners. But the point here is that as civil society organizations, this is a space that we should also begin thinking about. Let's get into impact investing. Let's get into partnerships, the structuring of deals with the government, with the private sector. Let's create bonds, education bonds, social impact bonds. Those social impact bonds are very useful in terms of getting resources to the organization, uh, getting uh, risk appetite uh, companies that uh, want to uh, invest, but they know they can get their money back once the performance has been done, and guarantees that are given by government. So if you structure your social impact bond very well, you are able as an organization to benefit from skills uh, acquisition to actually uh, deliver what ought to be delivered there, but making money out of it as an, as an organization. So we need experts to help civil society organizations uh, turn around what they are doing in the areas of health, agriculture, education, infrastructure. It doesn't mean we see lots and lots of new uh, structures and new deals that are a combination of blended finance and others. So getting into mission-related investments, uh, program-related investments, and Tapesaki might speak to that because the Ford Foundation has been supporting a lot of that. So I think that in terms of, you know, what are the new ways and the new sustainable ways of thinking, uh, those are some of the areas that I would really, really want to, to, to talk about, uh, or rather that I've talked about, and I think we should uh, pay more attention to them. And during discussion point, we can, you know, answer some of the questions that might come up. But let's also take advantage of the technology that exists today. Let's take advantage of the technology that exists today. Uh, every organization has the capacity to run several campaigns. And those several campaigns uh, can easily be run online and they can take different formats. You can have your own online giving page that you can work on with your team uh, and use the variety of social media and other forms of collaborative tools to actually get the, uh, the campaign going. You can have your own branded giving page. Uh, you know, you can also, like I say, partner with companies around employee giving schemes. Uh, we can do crowdsourcing. Um, today, there's a whole new rise on uh, cryptocurrencies and, uh, and NFTs, the non-fungible tokens, and how they are beginning to become a source of financing in the philanthropic space. I mean, the whole war in Ukraine now, if you look at the trends and the forms in which philanthropy has been practiced, it's been practiced through NFTs. And this is a good thing because it appeals to the young people, to uh, people who are in animation, who are in designs, who are in art, uh, and they can sell their stuff uh, using NFTs. And that's something that we can already, as civil society, start thinking about as programs, get young people into our programming, uh, get into this new space of gaming, get into the space of NFTs or cryptocurrencies and see how we can pivot uh, some of our programming towards that. Of course, all of this uh, will also require that we continually 
network and, and create uh, collaborations. Uh, and, those, and those are important because without people, without collaborations, none of what I've spoken about is going to work. So maybe uh, uh, I, I, I had another slide that was talking about instruments, which I think is important for, uh, for civil society to think about. But the point that I've just made before I speak about instruments is that in terms of the sustainable forms of, 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 of funding going forward, I see obviously, you know, firstly, civil society organizations not doing business as usual, but civil society organizations must adopt social entrepreneurship strategies and thinking. And that could essentially mean developing profit-making entities that fund their mother bodies or creating income generating activities within their own institutions subject to the limitations and the thresholds that the, uh, the laws of the country uh, apply or provide for, but also monetization, uh, like I said, of most of the work that you are doing, including expertise and skills. And I gave you the example of the Southern Africa Trust when I joined, and there are several other institutions like that. But I also gave you the idea of what's emerging between governments, uh, civil society and philanthropy, and how from a triangle of success and scalability, that is a platform for creating expertise, skills, experience for civil society to be able to scale its, its activities when given an opportunity. I also spoke about the rise of high net worth individuals as a potentially new source for you know, driving the work of civil society. Oxfam uh, showed a couple of years back, rather two or three years back, that there are three wealthy individuals in the continent whose wealth is equivalent to half the population of Africa. Just three. Now, eight the others, we have got sizable amounts of wealth. And, and if we thought about how it, some of those could drive the work and the missions of our civil society organizations, a lot would change. So that's one area that I think we need to do more, but we, like I said, we need to think and brand ourselves in such a way that uh, they find civil society as an instrument worth investing in. Uh, I then went on to talk about some of the innovative and available alternative ways to sustain our work that you find in technology, you find in, in shareholding schemes, you find in, uh, in the establishment of, um, of bonds and among others. Now, I want to end by talking about some of the instruments that you need to be familiar with uh, as civil society, so that as you think about some of these uh, sources and some of these options, you are also aware of how to uh, you know, configure yourself. Like I said, when I started, I gave the analogy of a, of, of, of a, a runway and, a, and an aircraft. Similarly here, when you are thinking about which option uh, to take as a funding, a uh, sustainable source, whether it's a combination or several of them, you also need to think about the instruments that you need to think about to configure yourselves. So I said that high net worth individuals have established their own foundations and generally they use their own foundations to implement their programs. The, the foundations also give grants, but what you are learning from here is that if you really want to work with the high net worth individuals, you might get grants, but if you don't create grants, then you want to figure out a way in which you can collaborate with them because they are also interested in implementing their own programs. So then we need to figure out a way in which we can collaborate with them. So it's not always necessary to go for grants, you can go for other things. Uh, but you, you, you then realize that there could also be other donors, I need with individuals and others who are interested, not giving grants, but to giving direct support. And so instead of you going to get money to travel for service providers and so forth, they can pay this directly on your behalf. And through a collaboration and an instrument, you can structure it in such a way that you get most of these things paid on your behalf without you having to go through the whole process of grant application reporting, which really takes a lot of time. Um, and then of course, joint programming. Increasingly, we are seeing lots and lots of consortia that are created because the pool of funding has really gone down. And so consortia has become another way of working. So who are the partners that are you likely to work with to join a consortia so that you are able to then show 
that you can co-create programs, but you can also uh, mobilize resources, leverage on each other's experience and be able to go for big grants that are likely to take you beyond to where you are. Um, of course, those who are in the, in the, in the education sector, uh, the, the corporate sector in most cases is interested in education, providing scholarships. How do you work with the corporates to turn this around such that their, their, their giving is broader than uh, scholarships to, to, to enhancing the other forms that I talked about? Uh, foundations will continue to give grants. So a, a part of civil society will still have to remain focused on looking for grants. But like I said, we need to start thinking about using grants as a way to safeguard, but also uh, to, to, to give us the platform in order to pursue new risky and, uh, and innovative ways of sustaining ourselves. Shareholding is new, but this is something that is likely to increase in the future. The last thing that I want to talk about, and I think it's covered uh, uh, in one of my in one of my slides later on, I'm not going to cover the resource mobilization strategy because I think that the site is going to talk on that. I had prepared slides on, you know, what are the ways in which you can mobilize resources, even given you the sustainable uh, uh, forms of sustainability going forward. But I, I really think that is important to, to have uh, a communication strategy that is able to distinguish the work that we do quite easily, quite accessibly, but quite powerfully so that we are, you are able to immediately tell what difference you are making as a civil society organization and why it is that we must keep you alive. Uh, because if we, if we don't keep you alive, there's going to be a negative impact in the world. So let me stop the colleagues uh, from ACT and I, would, I hope I'll be in a position to take some questions. Thank you so much for that insightful session. Um, we're so grateful. And yes, we do have questions. So um, I'm just going to look at the Q&A section. Um, we'll start with one. Um, Nancy Sixima wants to know, she says, how do we as CSO make ourselves attractive and send ourselves to possible philanthropists? Larger international and national organizations have shined small organizations, making the terrain very competitive and impossible to navigate. What instruments are there at our disposal? Can we apply to position ourselves for this market? Okay, uh, so I saw that question. Let me uh, try and, uh, and respond. So okay. one, of the, one of the things that we have done and one of the research that we did was to look at the barriers to civil society uh, scaling up you know, its activities and scope. And uh, clearly the issue of international NGOs came up and how they crowd out the space and the local institutions uh, are quickly, you know, uh, relegated to the margins. But, but one of the things that I think is powerful about local organizations, and maybe we haven't done a lot uh, about it in order to sell ourselves is that local organizations are embedded in the communities. Local organizations understand exactly what's happening with the communities. They understand the problems that they are responding to. They are part of the solution. There's no way in which an international organization will fly in and solve a local problem without the support of a local organization or a local network. We know that. We know that there's no way in which international organizations come in and solve problems. They find a local partner. We need to use that to our advantage. We are good at the knowledge, we get the knowledge, we know it. How then do we turn that into a selling point? So I think that's one of the things that we need to do. So let's use our, let's use our position in the continent, in the communities to sell our advantages. So, that, so that's the first one. But I think the second one is that obviously for us to get to the level and to the track record of international NGOs, we need to invest in some of uh, the areas that international NGOs are preferred for. So NGOs are preferred for their professional conduct, they are, pref they are preferred for, for, the, for the capacity that they have, the expertise, and some of the networks that they have. We may not have all of that as local organizations. But over time, if we invest in doing those things, we are going to become better and better at what we are doing. And there are 
organizations in the continent that support capacity building, that support long sustainability of organizations. And so we can make use of that to make ourselves more sellable um, and more attractive. But I think our greatest asset is our positionality and our knowledge of the communities that we work with. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's someone that has their hand up, so I'm just going to ask them to speak if it, if it, do you want to ask a question, your hand is up. Okay. Um, yeah, so there's someone else in the chat who says, hello, we didn't get the term used to describe an organization able to give a social certificate to to a donor for tax benefit filing an advantage office. This in the chat. Sorry, uh, the term for what? So he says, we didn't get the term used to describe an organization able to give a social certificate to a donor for tax benefit slash filing advantage, advantages purpose. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know what it would be called in Nigeria, but in most countries it's called a public benefit organization. So in other words, it, it, you apply for tax exemption because you are doing work that can be described as public good. Thank you very much. Um, there's another question that was sent to me privately. Um, Sakela, do you want to say something? Hello, are you there? Okay, um, so I'll just go to the question that was sent to me. Um, so how do you manage, so the question says, how do you manage um, trust with um, donors and beneficiary when there's a perception that your organization generates its own revenue? Sorry, can you, can, you, can, you, can you repeat the question? How do you trust? How do you manage trust with donors and beneficiaries when there's a perception that your organization generates its own revenue. So I'm assuming with the new model and you now making money, um, how do you manage that? Yeah, so the reality, the reality is that uh, uh, donor funding is on the decrease globally and uh, in our own countries, uh, civil society has been facing that, but it's now at an accelerated level. Uh, so that's number one, and donors know that they are not going to be here forever. In fact, a lot of donors are beginning to talk about exit strategies and all those things. So one thing to do is that if you, are, if you have donors and you are thinking of pivoting to you know, either a social entrepreneurship or generating your own activities, you've got to have a conversation with your donors around this new strategy. Uh, we, I did the same at the Southern Africa Trust. I, I sat with all the donors to talk to them about our new ways of thinking and how they could Thanks, support sir. us. Mm -hmm. right. Sorry? Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so I was saying we had the conversation with our donors around our new ways of uh, pivoting to new ways of, uh, of, of income generating and the impact that it was going to have on us as an organization and some of the shifts that we're going to make. And obviously in those shifts, there was going to be some in influence on the relationship that we have with donors. So we had to sit down with donors, explain to them where we were going and, and, and ask them to support us in our new, uh, new adventure. And of course, a lot of the donors, including the main donor that was pulling out, offered us different forms of assistance, technical assistance and so forth and so on to help us get to where we wanted to go. So the conversation needs to happen with the donors, but you also need to have the conversation with the partners so that they understand why you are venturing into making your own income and explain the benefits of making your own income. Uh, you know, the benefits of having your own income is that you are sustainable. You, you, you have more uh, resources to do what you want to do. You can actually, you know, even respond in, uh, in, 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 in cases like, an emergency and others without having to go through a whole process of budget reallocation that you normally go through with donors. So I don't think there's a big problem by generating your own income. I think the issue is if your own income is not, uh, you know, in, in many ways contradicting your mission 
as an organization, then you don't have a problem because in other ways, you are creating more resources for your partners and more resources for your intervention. Thank you so much. I think we have time for one more question and then I'll let you go. Um, so there's one question by Awa um, in the chat. She says, so please, if you can't sell what you're doing, if what you're doing can be sold essentially, maybe you create awareness on, on a particular disease, how do you sustain um, your organization if you don't have donor funding? That's the question. Um, can, I, can, I, can I get to the question again? I want to make yeah, sure that so I it's, it's in the chat. Is it, it on the chat or it's on the question? And uh... No, it's not in the question and answer, it's in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so the, basically asking if if their services can't be sold because maybe the organization is focused on like their aware, creating awareness around a certain um, disease, maybe like maybe a cancer screening or a sickle cell advocacy sort of. How do you sell that? Yeah, so my view is that everything can be sold. That's my view. I also used to think that advocacy cannot be sold, but now I know that you can sell anything. Uh, so we might want to figure out how to work with people uh, in marketing, in branding, uh, and in sales as civil society organizations to figure out how to turn our products into bankable products, into things that you can sell. The fact that you can offer it and somebody is interested in it is already an indication that someone might buy it. You just need to make a start and you will see you will sell it. Okay. Thank you so much um, for making the time. Thank you for the session. We're so grateful. I'm going to let you go because we know you have a class right after this. Um, we appreciate you for making the time and for speaking with um, change makers across Africa. There's been several people from across the group, um, the continent who have joined us today. And we're happy to have had you today. And we hope that um, we'll have a future opportunity to work together. Um, we'll take other questions later. Maybe we can send them to you and we can just do a brief summary in our thank you email. No problem. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to you, to my friend Defrek and everyone there. Uh, and I wish you the best in your deliberations. And uh, all the best to my colleague Tapesaki. I'm um, sorry, Tapesaki, I need to go and teach. I won't be able to listen to your presentation. I would have loved to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the for your participation, for your questions. I'm sorry if we weren't able to get to your question. Um, we'll do our best to answer afterwards and maybe send you like a summary of um, what the res what the response to the, the questions are. Um, we have a quick poll. We're going right into our next session, but before then, we have a quick poll that we would like to put up and ask that you please complete. Um, so it's going to come up on your screen right about now. Yeah, so please let me know if you can see the poll on your screen. Just let me know in the chat. Can you see the poll? Thank you. So someone says I can see it. So please complete it and give us your opinion on the questions. It's just about five questions. So we'll give like two minutes for this and then we'll um, introduce our next speaker and continue on with our session. Thank you to the 60 people who have completed their poll. We are up to 87. Thank you, thank you everyone. Friends close this in 30 seconds. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you to the 140 people who have uh, completed it. Um, so yeah, I think that's enough responses for now. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and now we'll be introducing our next speaker. 
give it a second to show my slide. Yes. Um, so the, I would like to introduce our next speaker for the session. Uh, his name is Tabasaki Maki Kemenjuma. Um, he's a senior, senior program officer for Foundation West Africa. Um, he has a PhD in international development and an MA in development studies from the University of East Anglia. He currently works at the um, intersection between um, gender, natural resources, and managing and manages grant making that integrates women and girls, disability, and youth lenses. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dabasaki as he takes us um, on our session on sustainable fundraising. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm not entirely sure how I would be able to share my slides. Okay. Um, let me make you co host. Okay, so you are co-host now and you can share. Should I send it to you directly to you, you can send it to me, but you can try one more time because um, I just made you co-host and you should be able to share. Or also send it to me. Okay. Okay. So I've just sent it to you, if you can see it, directly on Zoom. So good morning, everybody. I don't want to waste too much time. So I'm just going to start while we try to figure out uh, how to share the presentation. Um, thanks to everybody at ACT Foundation, uh, Ndi Freke and colleagues for inviting me to say, to share my thoughts on sustainable fundraising strategies for nonprofits. Um, just a couple of different things that I would like to say before I start. One is that I would mainly be sharing my perspectives um, on nonprofit fundraising challenges based on you know, my experience working at the Ford Foundation and the things that I've seen um, during the period that I've been working there. Um, the second is to say that Beggy has co covered a lot of the points that I uh, intended to cover in my presentation. So I would skip a number of my slides just so that I can focus on the things that he didn't cover in his, um, in his presentation. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so there are three things that I would like to cover here. The first is actually to start out talking about uh, the yeah, okay. So the first thing I would do is to talk about, you know, some of the challenges that affect fundraising of nonprofits in Nigeria in particular. I understand that there are people from different countries here, but I would focus mainly on uh, fundraising challenges in Nigeria. Uh, the second is to say that I would focus a little bit on, you know, trying to understand the donor landscape in Nigeria, you know, which is applicable in, in different places. I would not spend a lot of time here because Beggy has covered a lot of the points that I would have uh, referenced. So I would speak to some of the specific things that he mentioned in terms of what could be useful to look at with regard to um, program related investment and mission related investment. So all of them covered under the family of impact investing. And then I would spend a little bit of time talking about the changing donor landscape and you know some of the questions around sustainability. So if you can go to the next couple of slides, um, so the slide just after challenges here. 
So I guess the first place to start for me is to actually take a look at why do organizations need to fundraise? Um, you know, there are a range of different reasons organizations need to fundraise. And I, I you know, I, I would start by saying that um, for the most part, organizations fundraise because they have a project that is coming up and they would like to raise funds to support that specific project. So whether the project you know, is focused on education or on healthcare or on, or, or on agri or women's economic empowerment or on all the different topics that NGOs tend to work on, um, NGOs would raise funds because you know, they have a project that they want to um, carry out. Um, but the second thing is that NGOs tend to raise funds because there is a long-term development problem that they would like to address, you know, and the focus may be on systems change in a particular community or systems change in a country or systems change at regional level. And, you know, systems change may focus on addressing layers of disadvantage at particular um, parts of a community experience, or it may be about policy change at you know subnational, national, or regional level. Um, I, I raise this particular piece because this is the place where a lot of the long-term funding concerns for organizations tends to come up, uh, particularly for organizations that are focused on um, social justice. The bulk of the challenge, given that social justice issues tend to be long term in terms of thinking about them and because they take a long time to achieve sustainable change there. So in some sense, you know, just say that one of the other reasons that NGOs tend to raise funds is to um, try and address a systems change problem. The other reason organizations tend to raise funds is to strengthen the institutions in which they work, in, in through which they work right now, you know, so uh, as I would mention in the next slide, uh, organizations tend to need, you know, a number of different processes inside the institution, whether you're thinking about staff capacity or you're thinking about systems of internal controls, whether you're thinking about systems of record keeping, organizations, you know, tend to need um, these types of internal systems. And so um, fundraising is also focused or channeled towards, you know, these, this area of um, need. And then the fourth area that I would raise here is, you know, towards organizational resilience. And actually this comes to the heart of the question of sustainability. Uh, some organizations try to raise funds as a way to set up endowments, as a way to set up investments, as a way to set up, you know, kind of resources that will enable them to exist in the long term. And, you know, these could be some of the things that, you know, have been mentioned in the earlier presentations, like in the earlier presentation, like buying a building, as a way to take off the year-on-year -year costs that an organization would, would incur and you know, keep putting in place a structure that ensures that the organization can exist in perpetuity, you know, provided that some of the other issues are you know, taken care of. And just maybe one more point about buildings is that a lot of organizations also think about buildings as a way to um, generate income because buildings can then be used uh, to rent to other entities that would, you know, kind of provide income to the organization in question. So these are four, you know, reasons organizations would raise money. There might be other ones, but these are the four that I wanted to highlight in this morning. I think directly relating to that is um, the question about why do NGOs exist? So if you can go to the next slide, I will talk a little bit about both the challenges that I've seen in my work as well as, you know, and within that address the question of why NGOs exist. So the very first challenge that I've seen is inadequacy of problem analysis. And actually this goes to the heart of why does an organization exist? Um, if you've been in my class at LBS or uh, some of the other places where I've spoken about this, you know, you would know that problem analysis tends to come up um, on a regular basis. I think somebody has their hands up Light Adams, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? And please feel free to stop me at any point and also enter your questions in the Q&A box. Go ahead, Adams. Right, Adams, do you want to say something?
or is it the a previous time? You'll hear the announce in case you're sick. Say that again. Um, okay. He's, he seems muted. I'm asking him to unmute. So. Okay. Just move on. Maybe he'll I put think it you in. I think you could the, go ahead there. The okay. So, yeah, let me go ahead. So, I think my second point is so within problem analysis to really think about why does an organization exist um ngos exist for any number of different reasons but one of the key reasons that ngos are established is to solve specific problems and you know in in nigeria ngos have gone through several iterations and you know you have different types of ngos that operate in the country um, but one of the main reasons that NGOs are set up is to solve problems. And so here, I think the question is always, what exactly is the problem that you're trying to solve? And, you know, and we can have the big thematic blocks like education and health and um, economic empowerment or employment or agriculture. But those are the big blocks. You know, there's still the question of exactly what's the problem that you're trying to solve. So I will come a little, I will spend a little bit of time on you know the issue of problem analysis. But just to say here that one of the challenges that I've seen is the inadequacy of problem analysis in, in the proposals that NGOs tend to submit. The second is the alignment between problem analysis and the solutions that are offered. Again, I think you know there, there's a lot to unpack here in terms of the degree to which the problem analysis and solutions align. So sometimes an organization may say that they, you know, the, the main problem that they want to solve is X, but then the solution that they prefer would be completely different from the problems that they have identified in the earlier part of the document that they submit. So in the justification or problem statement, you know, sometimes the solutions are completely removed from. So when you look at the activities, you struggle to align these activities that are proposed with the um, problems that have been identified. So that's you know kind of the other piece that I've seen in proposals that I've I've reviewed in my time at the Ford Foundation. Um, the third thing that I would mention is that some organizations tend to have an omnibus organizational mandate. So you have organizations that want to do everything under the sun. They are, they are an organization that works on education, on health, on employment, on something else and something else. So you have a small organization starting out and trying to focus on five big topics. Um, you know, I think there are all kinds of questions embedded there, but that, that creates a challenge for a donor in terms of being able to figure out where you sit on that spectrum and trying to understand the capabilities that you bring to solving these specific problems that you're asking them to fund you for. Um, the fourth problem that I've seen or challenge that I've seen is a lack of understanding of donor focus. Uh, again, sometimes the proposals that organizations share are completely removed from the mandate or you know, um, work that a donor seeks to, to fund. And I'm sure that ACT Foundation colleagues would be familiar with this challenge, you know, where the proposal is sent, but it's completely different from either what you've advertised or what your organization stands set, set itself out to focus on. In some sense here, I think the problem is a problem of research. Um, before sending a proposal to a donor or a potential donor, I, I think it's useful to do some research to understand the work that the donor is doing, to make sure that you know the way that you have positioned the issue that you're trying to address it's consistent with the way the organization sees itself because without doing that that kind of creates a challenge for you in terms of being able to even secure a discussion for the ideas that you have in mind to to share with them um, and then the next problem is the problem of legitimacy. Um, and again, this is not a, it's, it's not a minor problem. I think it's a significant problem in the sense that an organization needs some kind of legitimacy. And the question is, whose mandate, on whose mandate are you doing this work? Who has sent you to do this work? You know, and, and, and there are publications about this topic, you know, there are whole books that have been written about Oxfam, for example, asking the question about who sent this organization to do this work that it's doing. So even when you have an idea 
to um, do some work on a problem that you've identified, you know, you would need to build in a layer of legitimacy into the work that you do. And there are a number of different ways that you can do that. One is to make sure that the problem that you're trying to address is actually relevant to the community that you're trying to work with, you know, so that you're not addressing a problem that has no you know, importance to the community that it's focused on. The other piece is within legitimacy is actually to figure out a way to engage with the community, you know, to make them aware of the work that you want to do and, you know, to get their buy-in in terms of, you know, um, the importance of the work and their involvement in terms of, you know, thinking through how to implement the work that you want to do. This is very, very important. And I think, Beg, you made the point about the distinction between INGOs and local organizations. You know, one of the, um, ways in which local NGOs can ground themselves is to demonstrate that they have legitimacy within the constituencies that they are trying to serve. And it may not necessarily be a specific community in the sense of a, a village or a, a local government, but it may be like an, a constituency of a specific type of group, you know, if it's young people or if it's women or if it's um, children or if it's schools, to have the legitimacy for the kind of work that you're trying to do, I think it's critical. And then the last point that I would make here in terms of challenges is really the, the focus on internal systems and structures. Uh, again, you know, NGOs tend to, some NGOs, not NGOs in general, but some NGOs don't have strong boards. They have boards that are members, all members of their family or members of their family and maybe one or two other people or people who are not engaged in the work of the organization. So I, you know, a, a good friend of mine was telling me this story about an organization whose board member was brought to a meeting with a donor and he was not briefed, didn't have an idea what was going on. So, you know, this person kept talking and saying, oh, our board member. And, and then at the end of the presentation, the guy was like, am I the board member that is being referred to? You know, because clearly he was not even aware that he was on the board of this organization and didn't understand, you know, what was being said. So it's important that the structures that you put in place are uh, properly done, that you have a strong board, that you have a board that at least understands what you're trying to do, that meets regularly to discuss the work that you're trying to do, that you have um, the legal status status in the organ in the country where you're operating that you have you know registration at the minimum with the um local level you know entity that is responsible for registering organizations but where possible at the national level you know to have the legal legitimacy to operate in the country and also that you have systems of internal control in terms of record keeping you know you may you may not be able to acquire expensive accounting and financing financial softwares, but you may be able to have a folder where you keep receipts of every expense that is made, you know, that things are signed for, you can create a simple form where expenses are recorded, where processes are recorded, in that you have policies that address different parts of the organization's work in terms of its finances, its safeguarding principles, you know, for all of the big topics that are important for, the area in which you're specifically focused. So if you work with vulnerable populations, for example, that you want to have a policy that articulates how you work with you know, that, that particular population. If you work with children, for example, how to make sure that children are protected you know, from harm, that, you know, that they're not exposed to risk, that you have some, some kind of articulation of what you expect. You know, and that those expectations may not necessarily be written by you know, a big outside consultant. It may be just five to seven, you know, important points that you want to make sure that you cover, you know, like somebody doesn't have a criminal history if they have to work with children, that, you know, they, that, that they, you know, are, they have the right level of education and training to be able to manage those kind of things. So, you know, to be clear about what your safeguarding principles are and also to be clear about what the sanctions are, you know, if those you know principles are violated. So, in sum, I'm saying that the big challenges that organizations face are they cut across, you know, a lack of understanding of the problem or a lack of articulation of the problem that they're trying to solve, all the way to the lack of institutional systems, you know, uh, that demonstrate that they exist 
as an organization, you know, with the legal and relevant internal structures to be able to receive funding from external entities. And actually, just to say here, lastly, that it doesn't matter who your donors are, your donors could be big international organize uh, have these systems in place as an organization, both for the questions of sustainability that we will address later and for ensuring that you know you are well positioned to receive support from um, here. I don't I think we can skip it and just go to the next slide in the interest of time. So maybe you can just skip that slide. So I think I will just spend two minutes here to say that you really want to understand the problem, you know, and you really want to understand who are the potential stakeholders to engage with and who are the beneficiaries or the people that you want to target as far as the specific intervention is concerned. You know, so it, it's important to say, to think about the problem at the, at the macro level in terms of the kind of the big issue. So let's say, for example, that you say, you know, there's a problem of, of um, attainment of primary education in, in this particular, you know, constituency that I'm targeting. You know, that could be the macro problem. But the question is, why is that happening? You know, and, and then to kind of look at why is this happening? Why is primary education attainment, you know, low in this community why is you know like what's what's causing that problem and that goes to the root cause of the problem you may find that the challenge is that children have to be made to go and you know sell in the markets to support their families or you may find that a um, particular groups of children or particular um, um gender of children are not being allowed to go to school and it depends on where in their places in which boys are not allowed to go to school or boys are preferred to send, spend time in, you know, in, in shops with their family members. Um, and there are places where girls are not prioritized for education. So really understanding why that problem exists, I think is critical because understanding why that problem exists means that you are situating your solution in the right place, that you're not, you're not providing a solution that does not address the problem in a substantive way. So really defining the kind of the problem at the macro level and then going down to understand, you know, why is this problem happening? You know, where is this problem coming from? Would really help you to then come up with a solution. And I think, you know, in some sense that the, the whole question of setting boundaries around your solution is being as specific as you can get in terms of, you know, what's the solution here? Um, and I, I tend to think about solutions as not trying to address the macro problem by figuring out a way to address, you know, a part of the root causes, you know, as a way to kind of get, so you are making a contribution to solving the macro problem rather than all of it. Uh, I hope that comes through clearly. And then in some sense to recognize that your solution is not necessarily foolproof, that your solution could also have limitations and to be aware and recognize those limitations, you know, and to figure out a way to, um, to prepare for those impediments that could occur in your, in your attempt to solve that problem. So let me stop for a minute and just see if there are any questions at this stage. I think there were, there's one hand of blessing Atungu. Okay. Um, blessing, um, can you unmute and speak? Hey, Blessing, are you there? Okay, so there's another hand by Toby. Um, Toby, do you want to say something? Also in Kiro. Hello. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. So thank you for this opportunity. Yes, sir. Uh, um, I work with um, people living with sickle cell and one of the major challenges is raising 
to help them manage their health conditions. So we've we've done different um, fundraising campaigns and uh, search for donors. But you talked about the problem analysis. Now, our major problem is helping people living with sickle cell to manage their conditions so they can live well and be productive. Now, for us, we get funds. We need to convince people that this is a worthy cost. And we don't normally get grants for this cost because some people think it's, it's a terminal issue. Why do we need to fund them? They might soon die. But what we have also seen is that if they are properly managed, they can contribute to the country very well. So, sir, if one wants to give a good problem statement for why people should support sickle cell, what would you advise apart from the need to manage? Although we have used the issue of um, entrepreneurship to, to help them be self reliant. We just did the program like two weeks ago, too. So, apart from looking for means to get donors, how will you? help us craft a problem statement that will give us access to donors and grants. Can we maybe take one or two more? Okay. Um, Can I come in? Yes. Yeah, hi. Go Good morning, everybody. And uh, well, ACT Foundation, congratulations for, the, for putting up this program. I think I would want the Ford Foundation um, presenter to speak to the issue of, um, will I call it ideas and proposal theft and giving funding or access to funding to friends and family? Because, um, I mean, we know how it runs. In, we've seen nonprofits, starting up a nonprofit organization often is, I mean, is often a passion-led, unstructured uh, way of um, corporate social responsibility, responding to the needs of your society, okay? Over time, the idea starts from one person, expands to other people, and you keep on, let me just move straight in. Let's take the issue of gender equality and empowerment of women in Nigeria. We've had uninterrupted democracy for more than 23 years. That's two and a half decades. There are over 1,550 registered gender-focused organizations working on gender equality and empowerment of women. The last straw that broke the camel's back is that we have gone through like five or six administrations, done about five or six constitutional reviews, and none has been able to address the five gender issues that have consistently put women down in this system. Mm -hmm. For crying out loud, you ask yourself, where do the Hi. women of Nigeria go wrong? Hello. Hello. Hi. Please, um, I'm sure this session is going to cover a few things um, because he has limited time, right? Um, he's going to try and answer this, but I will just hold off every other question. Mm -hmm. Debesaki, I'm sorry. I just don't want to interrupt you too many times. Okay. So that we do justice to the session and then we'll take all these questions at the, at the end. end. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you so so no, I think those are actually two very good questions. And actually, thanks, thanks for your questions, both Toby and Nkiru. Let, let me start with Toby's question. And I think one of the other questions in the chat about you know the whole point about micro versus macro. So uh, and I, I'll use Toby's question as a way to actually respond to, to that question as well. So my thinking is, you know, Toby, in your specific case, one of the things that I've read about, you know, in the last year or two is about where do you situate um, uh, sickle cell anemia? You know, um, and, and within the wider conversation about disability, there's, there's a case that's continuously being made about sickle cell anemia as a form of disability. So for your specific instance, the macro problem is, you know, that there are individuals who are exposed to this, this condition over their lifetimes. And so the macro problem there is that sickle cell anemia is a form of disability. So that's what you're looking at. The question then becomes, what is your solution to this particular form of disability across the spectrum of solutions that exist? And 
one needs to think a bit carefully about what one is communicating because depending on which donor you're reaching out to, some donors may find some solutions to be counterproductive. So you talked about you know, supporting them to live their lives or to live meaningful lives, to live, you know, I sense that you're talking about, you know, both healthcare and economic empowerment. So those are very needs-based approaches to addressing the challenges of persons with disability. And in some sense, you know, needs-based approaches are considered valid approaches to addressing, you know, their challenges. You know, obviously um, people need people need resources to be able to live, you know, uh, at least at the very basic level. And also people, you know, with disability, some of them need a bit more healthcare than other people in society. So these are valid, you know, points, but in some sense, some other people might think, but hold on, why is everyone thinking about persons with disability from a point of view of economic empowerment? Because there's a whole, you know, community of persons with disability right and on the economic spectrum they run all the way from people who need that kind of help to people who you know are they they have their own means of income they have their own businesses they are ceos of companies or they're high up in their organizations and so for some of the people that you may reach out to they might feel like actually this approach is not a way to solve the problem that you know they would like to focus more on approaches that elevate agency and voice and participation and engagement because those are at the heart of kind of the systems and structural problems that affect persons with disabilities. So you may have heard, for example, you know, campaigns that focus on um, enabling persons with disability to vote in elections because, again, those are kind of more systemic problems, you know, that could inhibit the voice and participation of persons with disability. So I'm saying in a nutshell that actually the, the way that you figure out what micro level is relevant to a specific donor, I think is actually very important. So situating it properly at the macro level is useful, but also kind of going down again to the, to the root problem. Why is this happening? Is it that healthcare institutions are non-challenged and don't provide healthcare to persons with disability? Uh, or with or persons with sickle cell, and if that's the case, where do you want to focus? Do you want to focus on changing the healthcare system, or do you want to provide palliative care to individual persons with disability? And then someone might ask, how many of these individuals can you actually cater to in your specific pro program, and for how long? Given that these are long-term Um, to your point, Nkiru, I think that you raise a valid point about process, and I'm going to talk a little bit about donor processes uh, in a little bit, because in some sense, you know, the, the question that you're asking is, how do we have a better understanding of how donors work in order for us to present our proposals both at the right time and to the right places? And I, I think the question of process is actually quite useful and uh, I will come to that question of process in a little bit. Um, but some of the points that you made about, you know, the success versus failure of, of advocacy campaigns is to say that, you know, one of the challenges that we know with systems change is that they take a long time to achieve, you know. Um, some of them take hundreds of years to achieve, some of them take tens of years to achieve. The one thing that we should know is that each effort that is made stacks on top of the other. You know, uh, you know, we live in a very different world today than we did in 1980 or 1970 or 1960. You know, the world is changing more and more now, right? And there are things that happen now with regard to, let's say, women's economic position that wasn't necessarily the case in the in the 60s and 70s or even 80s. Um, so. And that's happened partly because of the efforts of women, you know, in the past. So the struggle for economic emancipation of women has been around for a long time. You know, in the 30s, you know, you had in the 20s, you had big campaigns that were led by women. In the 30s, you had big campaigns that were led by women. So I'm talking about the Aba women's riots. I'm talking about the Abiyokuta women's uh, revolt. So 
it's been a, several decades of struggle and each struggle stacks on top of the other. So some of the results you know, that we have today as a result of struggles that have happened in previous years. So I think that progress is slow and frustrating, but we recognize that each of us, wherever we are, and coming to the question of fundraising, each of us, wherever we are, would recognize what our specific contribution to the struggle for, in this case, women's political, women's political participation or women's political representation. And if we can stack it on top of the others, you know, at our community level, at you know, a higher level, at national level, it would continue to build for future generations. You know, we recently had the not too young to run um, bill passed and the constitution amended as a result. Now younger people are able to present themselves as candidates in elections, you know? So in some sense, progress is slow and maybe frustrating, but we also all recognize that systems change takes time and it would take continued effort and investment, you know, to achieve the kinds of change that we want in society. So I just wanted to kind of provide a bit more explanation in terms of you know, the second point that you, you raised. And yes, you know, my presentation can be shared with everybody. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so I have another quiz that actually I would like you to just note it down in your notebook. I'll give you one minute to just note it down in your notebook or, or just take the questions down. Who are the donors that are funding in your specific area of interest? I know there are a lot of you here and you work in different sectors. Who are the donors that you feel are relevant to your specific area of interest or focus? Um, and how do you think your organization can become a grantee or a grantee or partner of these donors? And the third question is, how can you show a donor that your work matters? I think these questions came up in the previous, um, some of uh, variations of these questions came up in the, in the previous session as well. And I wanted to just flag them as important questions that we would try and address in the, uh, in the next section of this uh, presentation. If you can move on to the next, next slide, please. So I, I would like to say that, you know, there are a, a whole range of donors in Nigeria, and you, you can think about it in your specific country context. Um, a whole range of donors that fund NGOs in, in different places. And each of them have their own types of approaches. You know, I think Beggy spent a lot of time in this section, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just to say that governments of different variations, you know, governments from developed countries, some developing countries um, fund different types of programs in, in Nigeria. You know, embassies, for example, fund some programs in Nigeria, you know, and depending on the area where you work, you know, uh, embassies like the US, the UK, the Netherlands, uh, Sweden, um, Canada, um, Japan, the German, Germans, mostly through GIZ, um, fund a lot of uh, development initiatives in Nigeria. You know, some of these run all the way from sexual and reproductive health to uh, work that addresses women's economic empowerment, gender-based violence, um, to um, skills development training for young people. And GIZ, given the nature of the organization as a private company that represents government in, in different places, they kind of do a lot more work across the spectrum, all the way to work that is focused on um, helping to build up the impact investing space in Nigeria. And of course, environment and energy related questions. So there's a whole range of things that government donors tend to fund. And, and I think the bulk of us tend to target, you know, government donors, you know, in terms of the work that we do. And I'm going to say one or two things about government donors. So some of the earlier points that I made with regard to setting up your institutional systems actually becomes particularly important when your target is government donors, because the requirement to get support from a government donor is much higher than it is for, say, uh, a philanthropy of, or, say, a private company. And I'll tell you why, because government donors are answerable to, to, um, to taxpayers. You know, so I, by government, I mean bilateral donors. You know, they're answerable to taxpayers. And so, they tend to set up their standards a bit higher in a way that they can answer the questions that may be asked in their national parliaments 
or elsewhere. So again, just to emphasize that point about setting up systems of internal control, it's so important. And it actually doesn't matter what your source of money is. It can be anyone, you know, but it's important that you have systems of internal control and records keeping. So I'll give you one example from my younger years, um, just, you know, to, to cite how to build up your record keeping system. So when I was uh, 17 or 18, I started working for this group called, uh, I, I founded this group called Youth Development Initiative. It was, was not, it didn't even qualify to be an NGO or whatever. It was a really small group. It was registered with the state government and everybody that donated money to that organization were private people. They, you know, like one uncle there gave 5,000 naira, somebody there gave 20,000 naira. It was not, but what I did that time, you know, long ago, more than 20 years ago was I would write them an official letter to ask for the money. I would keep a copy of the letter. And when they do donate money, I would send them an acknowledgement and thank you letter. And the money went to someone in the organization who was the treasurer. And every time that money had to be released, a note had to be written to the treasurer for the purpose of keeping records about, you know, it was not a lot of money. It was like, what? At the best, in the best case scenario, maybe we had 20,000 there. But if you go back today, if you were so curious and you wanted to see the records of that organization today, there is a record somewhere that exists that you know, shows how money was spent, you know, maybe a total of 100,000 there, or I don't know, it was not a lot of money, but there's a record that shows how money was spent. You know? So if someone decided to pick up the organization today, they would have some history to build on. So it's very, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be, you know, like you don't need to have a big donor base in order to set up these systems of internal control. And I'm spending time on them because I find that a lot of organizations struggle with this, partly because they don't, they feel that the time to do it is when they have a big donor base, but actually you can do from just as little as you have. And now there are free softwares that enable you to do actually these record keeping systems uh, in a very easy and flexible way. For my personal use, I use a, a software that allows me to in include actually everything, receipts from expenses that I make. You know, if I buy a cup of coffee there, I can take a picture of the receipt and put it on the software if I want, but at least I can just note that I spent two naira or 50 naira or 100 naira in buying coffee the other day. So record keeping is important for government donors. All the others I'll just run through. So you have philanthropy, um, you have you know local private philanthropy, both corporate, both corporate and, um, and, and private, and you have international philanthropy like the Ford Foundation, MacArthur Foundation, you know, that operate and do work in, in Nigeria. So, you know, those are organizations, you know, that, um, that, that work within the philanthropic landscape in Nigeria. You have multilateral institutions like the UN uh, and, and the World Bank and IMF and those that operate in Nigeria. And then you have the private sector. So the private sector is interesting for me because, you know, you have one arm that is focused on corporate social responsibility. And increasingly now you have SPVs being set up by the private sector in, sector in Nigeria, uh, both in, to, as a way to channel resources towards the communities that they work with, but also as, as vehicles for their corporate social responsibility. And in some companies, you actually have both existing concurrently. You know? So you have both the CSR work as well as the corporate um, philanthropic arm of, of those organizations. Um, and then lastly, you have private individuals, you know, who call themselves philanthropists. Uh, philanthropists. And it, again, there's a whole spectrum here. You have uh, individuals who are politically exposed persons who seasonally give money to specific things uh, as a result of their political interests. You know, so it's election seasons. Now, a lot of people will get secondary school scholarships. A lot of YAC fees will be paid. A lot of jam fees will be paid. People will get scholarships to universities because it's that time of the you know, electoral cycle. Um, and those people, you know, in some sense, would qualify as philanthropists. You know? um, and then you have private individuals who are high net worth individuals, as Beggy was saying earlier, who you know, also uh, 
either have vehicles set up, you know, in form of private private philanthropy, or that they just, you know, donate large sums of money to specific things. So, you know, there are people in the oil sector, for example, that uh, donate to universities, you know, to build hostels, um, or that, you know, um, provide support to particular things in their communities. They give scholarships, they, um, they um, build hospitals. So depending on, you know, the kinds of interests that they have, and, but they don't necessarily have vehicles. They may be recognized as philanthropists, but they don't have vehicles, you know, through which they, they channel their funds. So, in any case, these individuals could also be targets for, uh, for fundraising of as donors, you know, can be considered as donors in in Nigeria. So, uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but I wanted to say that what I find interesting across these categories of donors is that. There, I, actually, we can stay on the previous slide. There are some commonalities that exist amongst them. And I'll just mention two of them. One is to show that you are, you are a serious organization. You know, and the way that you can show that you're a serious organization is by being clear about the work that you are doing. So going back to kind of what I said about identifying the problem, is being clear that you're a serious organization by you know, um, being clear about the work that you're doing. The second is to show that you have history and a commitment to the issue that you're working on. Uh, and, and that has two dimensions. One is being consistent in the work that you're doing as, as an organization, you know, so that everyone can see what you're working on. So it's challenging if this, if today you're working on agri and tomorrow you're working on health and the next day you're working on education and the next you're working on something else then it's difficult you know for an organized for someone to situate you you know properly on the spectrum um, but the other thing is that if you have a, a good system of record keeping and here i'm not talking about finances but actually record keeping about your work as an organization you know so that means being able to produce annual reports about the work that you do and again it doesn't have to be a fancy you know kind of well colored report, whatever, it can be a two page note that shows that in a given year, you did X, Y, Z, you had X, Y, Z level of engagement, you know, and, and, but what it shows is that you have a record of the work that you've done. And if it's requested in the future, you can, you can provide it to an organization to say, you know, we don't, we, this is the report that we have of a given year, because this is what we did. And to the degree that you have pictures, what have you to kind of show what you've done, I think it'd be useful to include those as well. So let me run more quickly just because of time. So processes, I think Nkiru had asked earlier about process. Donors, you know, use a range of different processes to identify organizations that they work with. I, again, back to the questions that I had raised earlier about demonstrating the importance of the work that you do. How can you show a donor that your work matters? Actually, you know, it's relevant in this particular piece around process. So actually both the second and third question are relevant in terms of thinking about process. So I'll, I'll tell you why. So donors tend to use requests for proposals. They, they use, um, they find you by your reputation, by recommendations from uh, similar organizations, you know, that, you know, and they, they find you by looking at your historical work as an organization. Some donors use competitions and others use a combination of these, you know, different ways of finding an organization. So why is it important for, you know, you to how uh, to kind of think about those questions that I raised earlier? How can you become um, a donor partner or grantee? So, you know, two things here. One is, again, that, that point around showcasing your work. Um, because in some sense, if you're not out there, then no one would know that you exist. So that's you know, one point that is important, really showcasing the work that you do. Even if you can't build an expensive website, you can have a WordPress site, you can have a Google site, you can have a free server site. There are many domains that are available for free and they come with templates. So you can kind of set up a free page somewhere 
that you can point people to about your work. And you know, you can have a simple website that you know says what you do basically, what's your mission, your goals, your objectives, like what do you set out to do, what activities have you done, or what specific projects are you working on at that particular point in time. So that's important because that's the way that if a random donor whose work is mainly based on finding grantees by reputation, is trying to find you, they would only be able to find you if you're out there. Um, the other piece is, um, to how do you show to a donor that your work matters? I think it's by basically um, first showcasing your results, that the results of the work that you've done, you know, and, and putting it out there. But also again, back to this question of being consistent. Um, because I personally have struggled in moments when I've seen an organization that is, you know, working in different places and they are just starting out. So for the younger organizations that are just starting out, you really want to keep your focus on a specific topic and a specific dimension of that topic, you know, as a way to continue to position yourself for kinds of support that you, uh, you would want to get from donors. So RFPs are requests for proposals. Uh, basically they are announced. So Act Foundation, for example, you know, does announce that it's now it's now that time of the year when it will receive grant proposals so please submit this type of information as a way to signal that you want to be considered for um, a grant from that organization so a lot of organizations will put out call for proposals request for proposals you know for you to then submit an application to them Okay, so just moving quickly uh, to the next slide. So I just wanted to sp spend one or two minutes to talk about institutional support. Again, just going back to the earlier slide where I talked about why do organizations raise money? You know, two angles of that that I talked about were the piece about um, organizational resilience and institutional capacity. And actually you may even want to include the piece around systems change in that bucket. Um, donors, some donors set out to really be able to provide that kind of long-term support and they exist in different ways. There are bespoke programs that are focused on institutional strengthening for organizations. So Ford, for example, has a build program that it's a five-year institutional strengthening program and supports organizations at the cutting edge of their work as a way to really position them to do long-term work. Um, another layer of you know, support that donors tend to provide is unrestricted multi-year support that enables organizations to do strategic work across the specific body of identified work that's important to them. And then a third you know, type of support that's available is core general support. And in Ford speak, Core support is support that is available to support a specific body of work. You know, so if you say that you're working on education, for example, then that support is available to your organization to support that body of work without necessarily defining it in detail as a project would be. Um, I'm going to skip the next couple of slides and just go to the last three slides. So if you can go to the next one. So again, Beggy spoke a lot to some of these. I think I just wanted to highlight the piece about domestic resource mobilization. How do you raise money locally in your specific country? Increasingly, you know, domestic resource mobilization is being highlighted. Beggy talked about the sustainable development goals. The, the UN for the last decade or so has been emphasizing the need for domestic resource mobilization as a way to fund development, you know, and in that context, there are different vehicles that are recommended in the kind of more social spectrum. There are a number of approaches that have been used to raise money locally. One of them is crowdsourcing and actually a good example to give with regard to crowdsourcing. Um, actually, two good examples. One example is with regard to healthcare and education support for individuals. You know, in the last six to seven years, we've seen increasingly fundraising targeted at supporting healthcare for individuals who, who are in a serious conditions. Um, 
needing support and funds have been raised using crowdsourcing platforms to, to support their healthcare. And these, these have been done either via TV or via radio or via the internet. Um, and platforms exist, you know, like GoFundMe to be able to aggregate funds in this way. And one way that I've seen, you know, crowdfunding used to support good work that is kind of more advocacy focused is actually um, the NSAS protest in, in 2020, where, you know, a lot of money was raised in very short time um, by young people through, you know, crowd, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding mechanisms. So that's a way that, you know, we can raise money locally. And I think for me, it goes back to the heart of what I said in the beginning about on the way in which your mission and mandate is perceived in a specific community, you may be able to actually aggregate funds from communities, you know, to support the kind of project that you're trying to work on. And we know that the development trajectory of Nigeria, there are a lot of communities that have done self-help projects, uh, partly, you know, by kind of crowdfunding across the community to address a specific problem of concern in, in that place. So crowdfunding, you know, driven by technology is increasingly a way that you can raise money. Um, all of the other ones have been mentioned. So I'll just mention one more, which is the question of membership fees. You know, depending on the structure of your organization, you may be able to secure membership fees from your members, you know, as a way to support the organization's operations um, and maybe support some of its projects. And, you know, and there are organizations that have that kind of orientation and are able to raise money through membership fees, you know, and this can be student bodies, youth associations, you know, women's bodies. Um, so depending on the structure that this organization has, one way to raise money locally is, to, is through membership fees. If we can go to the next slide. So who gives money uh, locally? Um, in Nigeria, again, it's a whole diff it's a whole range, right? Governments, you know, state governments, local governments, sometimes fund NGOs to do work, you know, in 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 their states or local governments, depending on where you are, you know. Uh, sometimes they are they are what people call gongos because they are you know kind of government driven NGOs. Um, but sometimes they're also legitimate NGOs doing good work that are funded by government departments or supported by government departments or through partnerships, government departments contribute to a project that, you know, an NGO is trying to do in Nigeria. And we've seen this, you know, in, in different places uh, across Nigeria. And, and of course, you know, um, community contributions, either through the community development committees of communities or through associations that bring community members together have also been sources of fundraising. So let me go to the final, the very final slide and just talk for five minutes about uh, sustainability. Uh, some of these I've talked about over and over again, so I would skip. So I think it's just to highlight that focusing on really deepening your understanding of the problem matters. Because once you situate yourself in the right problem that you know, means something to the community and has long-term implications, then it helps you to be really focused on what you do over the long-term. So that's kind of the first thing that I would say that for your organization and your work to be sustainable, one of the first things that you want to do is To say a little bit about, but that's the first thing for me. The second is actually to figure out a way to name to to name your your um, solutions. So actually, that should be solutions rather than problems. So modeling or naming your solutions actually matters. Um, if you look at a lot of the the big international organizations, they tend to name the solutions that they're offering to the problem. You know, so they, they model the problem. You know, some of the groups that I work with, for example, you know, would, would describe their work as let's say community empowerment model. That's that's the way that they name their 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 particular solution. So everybody 
who associates with them can think, oh, if I'm thinking about the work of XYZ organization, I would be thinking about community empowerment model. So really be, being able to name the solutions that you bring to the table is actually as important as identifying the problem. Because sometimes you may be doing a project that you then end up using the long hand by saying, oh, projects to enable women's economic uh, participation or economic development or economic empowerment in so-and-so local government area. Whereas if you were able to name it, it could then become that thing, you know, and then you could provide a longhand explanation as needed. So figuring out a way to name or model your solution is important. And, you know, that means being able to say for this problem, this is how we name our solution. These are the three legs of our solutions. solution, whatever those three legs are, whatever those four legs are, whatever those five legs are. So anybody knows that, okay, community empowerment model means one, two, three, four, five, whatever numbers you choose. So that's important, you know, from my point of view. The other thing is invest in staff, invest in systems, invest in structures. I've talked about this over and over again. For sustainability purposes, you really want to make those kinds of investments. I cannot emphasize that enough. Actually, you know, where possible, I think it would be useful to spend some time researching um, ways to build systems of record keeping that can ensure that even when, let's say that the organization decides to go out of operation for any reason, that you know, the records can be available in perpetuity. You know, and there are archiving systems you know, that could enable you to do this you know, well. Um, two last things before I stop talking. Um, I think all of the other things about investing in strategic plans, writing resource mobilization strategies and communication plans are important. Um, but the last thing that I would say is that you really want to figure out a way to invest in establishing some kind of financial reserves, because the question of organizational sustainability, as Bergi was saying, really depends on your ability to perpetuate the resources that you have in some way. And one way that you can do that is by investing in market instruments to the degree that those market instruments are consistent with your organization's ethics and your organization's philosophy. You know, you don't want to be investing in things that are inconsistent with your organization's overall philosophy. So for example, you don't want to be investing in say, uh, a cigarette or alcohol factory if your organization's work is a campaign to uh, prevent alcoholism or if your campaign, if your, if your organization's work is focused on, you know, um, I don't know, um, reducing smoking or removing smoking. You don't want to be investing in those kinds of companies. But really figuring out a way to inv invest in market instruments is important because it's an important way of ensuring that you have resources for the rainy day You know when you would need uh, funds and giving the changes in the donor landscape that those funds are not available to you at that particular point in time. So let me stop. You know, this, this has been a long period of me just talking. So I'm going to now stop here and turn it over to you all for any questions, comments, actually disagreements, pushbacks, whatever you have, you know, I would really welcome any of those. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have some questions in the Q&A section, so people have asked questions in the chat as well. And I think I saw a hand up, a few hands up. Um, but I'd like to start with one question in the Q&A section because it has come in different variants. Essentially, it's asking how can small CBOs get that equal playing ground to access funds like big indigenous NGOs? So a lot of people have asked this today. I can't hear you. This is a it's a tough question because to be fair, you know, the topography of the donor landscape is never going to be equal. I think some organizations will always be ahead of others because, and it's not, it's not, at least in my view, it's not necessarily because of bias. I, I think it's because um, or maybe it's partly because of bias, but it's not because organizations dislike the the 
the other organizations that are pro proposing ideas, it's because one, organizations have finite resources, you know, even if ACT Foundation were to receive all of the money that Access Bank has, your resources will still be finite, in which case you would still have to make choices. So just by, by virtue of the fact that organizations do not have to make choices, it means that some organizations would not be able to get resources, even if their ideas and proposals were the best in town, just because, you know, some them there, there may be other ones that are selected based on considerations like intersectionality, like the population that they're focused on, like a specific angle that they're bringing to the work that they're trying to do that this other organization doesn't have. So the playing field, just to be clear from my point of view, will always be challenging, which is why organizations need to continuously improve themselves and invest in ways to position themselves to be seen. Having said that, you know, there are two things that I would like to say. One is invest in people, you know, to respond to the specific question that has been raised, invest in people. You know, um, we, we, someone said earlier, I think it was in Kiru who said that, you know, NGOs are passion driven work. That's true, only up to a point, you know, passion, uh, keeps you in the job, but actually from the point of view of a donor, you also need to show competence. So in some sense, the question is who's working for you and with you? You need to show that those people are the best people to be able to do the work. You know, the fact that you position yourself to talk about a problem doesn't necessarily mean that you're the best person to solve it. So it's important to really demonstrate that you are well positioned to solve that problem. And that means investing in people with the right, the right skills and competencies and capabilities to be able to actually address that problem. And if you can't hire them full time, you can ask them to be advisory, to be volunteer advisors to your project. You know, that way you get strong names in your proposal that agree to be part time, you know, or volunteer staff of your organizations, but of, of your organizations, but you don't necessarily have to pay them. And then not just have them, but also have them make inputs into the way that your idea is structured. So just to say that it's a, it's a challenging balancing act for even donors. Um, again, remember that donors are answerable to their boards, they are answerable to their to their governments, they're answerable to the a population in terms of you know bilateral donors and all of these donors would have to show that when they have given out money that they have given it to the best possible entity or individual to do the work that they are that they're trying to do so it's really for the organization to continue to improve itself position itself rethink its work ensure that it's at the cutting edge of the work that it's trying to do you know and with persistence you know, an organization will be able to receive some funding. And just one last thing, you know, to be realistic about how much you're asking for. So if you've never received money before, like this is your very first time, you're brand new, like you can't realistically be asking for $1 million or even $100,000 from a donor. Because, you know, when they look at your history, there would be nothing in your history to demonstrate that you're actually capable of being able to receive that volume of money, you know. So you probably actually want to start from competitions or from responding to RFPs. And when you do reach out to a donor, if you do have access to someone like me or other people working in private philanthropy, that you want to be realistic about how much you're asking for, that you're not, because what you actually want to do is to signal that you can receive and manage money. So if a Ford Foundation gives you, let's say $1,000, what they're giving you is actually not just the money. They're giving you $1,000 with a brand. So next time, you may or may not mention how much Ford Foundation has given you, but you can say that Ford Foundation has given you money in the past. So think if you think about it in that way, then you would be looking at what is the absolute amount that I need to do this particular work? And what skill is the right level to start? So being realistic with how much you're asking for, I actually think is a, one of the strong points in terms of, because sometimes you read a proposal, this organization is brand new, they probably registered just last month and they're asking for $500,000 and you're thinking, but where is the history to back up this, you know? So 
I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll take one more from the chat and then we can just um, let one person ask privately. Uh, I think there was one from Nancy. Uh, once you have secured a donor for a project, how can an organization ensure renewal of grants for continued multi-year funding? Presenting donor relations where there is stiff competition for funding for one particular donor can be an uphill task. Which we I can't for. hear you at all. The, 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 it oh, okay. Old. Is it better now? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I was asking a question from Nancy. She had asked, once you, had, once you have secured a donor for a project, how can an organization ensure renewal of grants for continued multi-year mm -hmm. funding? Retaining donor relations where there's a stiff competition for funding for one particular donor can be an uphill task. Which way forward for organizations to maintain a donor, a donor, a donor once secured? Mm -hmm. So now that's a good question. So I, I, I have to say that it really depends on who your donor is. Um, some donors, you can almost take it for granted that once they start funding you, they will continue to fund you. I, you know, and I, there are a number of philanthropies that you know their funding tends to be first multi-year, which means that you know at the very beginning you get two or three years worth of funding. Um, and that when that funding ends, you know, provided that everything else remains stable, like the organization doesn't change its focus and mandate and what have you, that they will likely continue to fund you. It's not guaranteed, but you can almost take it for granted. But here's the thing. Uh, how do you keep a donor? By really being responsive and responsible as a, an organization. So, you know, like, I'm sure, you know, Indy Freke and the team would relate with this, that one of the biggest problems donors tend to have is getting reports back um, and, and getting reports that actually reflect the work that has been done, because it's not just getting reports back, but it's getting reports that reflect what's been done. Sometimes you get a report and it just looks too fantastic and you're thinking, but wait, how come I never heard about any of this happening? I'm in the same space, right? And you start asking questions and everything starts falling apart because the organization has exaggerated its achievement in that particular area. So you really want to be responsible and responsive. Those two things are important. You want to do what you said you will do and you want to be responsive when the donor is looking for you. If there are milestones that you've agreed to that you want to make sure that you're fulfilling those milestones, you know, it's not that hard to be a donor, darling. I think you just need to really be responsive and responsible, but it depends on your donor. Some donors only give money through requests for proposals, which means even if they fund you now, you still need to participate in the next competition to get money. So even if you're very nice and doing well and responsive and what have you, you know, next time you would still need to submit a proposal because that's the only recognized process for that donor. Um, but doing well the first time makes it easier for you to be admitted the second time. You know, like nobody wants to keep a bad egg. If the egg is spoiled, they don't, they want to throw it away. So in some sense, you know, being responsible and responsive and doing the work makes sure that next time the donor will consider you more favorably because now you have a history with them. Thank you very much. Did you much. want to take um, one or two, maybe two okay. uh, questions? Yeah, so I'm going to go to people who have their hands up. And um, I think I saw Sakile. Okay. Sorry, um, let me just respond to this person. So, and, and Edie's experience is actually not insignificant. It is important. It also shows history. So if your ED has a decade of experience, five years of experience, you know, going back to the point I made about staffing, you know, you want to show that the staff have the history in doing that kind of work. So not just the ED, but the other staff, if you have a finance staff who has been in finance or banking or whatever for so many years, you also want to highlight that because those are important, you know, um, thanks for raising that question. That's a good question. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, 
Okay. Um, Ulubumi, would um, you like to ask your question? You can speak. Okay. Um, Monday, John. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, thank you, Mark, for the insights. Uh, you really took time to go into the details. Um, so I have a, a question. Um, do you mind sharing with us the areas of funding available uh, from the Ford Foundation, and then how organizations can assess such funding, if you don't mind. Yeah, can we maybe take two more of those questions and then I'll just answer all of them and conclude. Okay, that's fine. Um, Olubomi, if you're there, you can speak. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, we we'll really appreciate um, the beautiful presentation. Please, um, we want to find out how smaller organizations can approach bigger ones. Because honestly, we, um, I personally feel intimidated um, approaching some of those um, bigger organizations. I'm a professor and I have my NGO in Ugo State. But at times reaching, for instance, let's say for the foundation, you want to see someone to discuss what you do. How do you do that? Because Oftentimes you send mails, you send details of what you are doing, nobody responds. Then you want to go in physically to at least talk with someone. You know, at times you meet with an Indra. So how do we go about that? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll ask Mohammed now. Mohammed, if you're ready. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My question, thank you so much for your presentation it was uh, very clear and makes sense for us uh, my question here is how can small organization win and while most of the application questions ask for milestone and i think that's that's the biggest stumbling block that stop a small organization from accessing grant because they have not achieved much and most of the application questions ask for milestone and again, I need some explanation regarding only solicited funds. Thank you. Okay. So should we pause there? So can, can, we, I think, can, can I speak? Can I, I ask you? Monday. And that, then yeah. we, we can answer the, those and end okay. there. So, sorry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My question is, uh, you said there are some softwares uh, that can be used by uh, in, uh, maybe uh, young NGOs. Please, can we have the names of some of those softwares so that we can also try to use it? I'm, I'm managing the young NGO, so I will need uh, those softwares. Thank you. So I think that's the easy one to answer. So let me start from there. I'm not well positioned to recommend any, so I'm going to try not to recommend any, but I think maybe ACT Foundation could recommend something or at the bare minimum, you can Google free NGO finance software, whatever, and you would find a range of options, but I would rather desist from making recommendations since that's not my area of expertise. Um, the other questions I think are, actually very similar. So I'll, I'll try to respond to the two questions by Professor Lubumi and Mohammed together. So actually, you know, in terms of access, there's a degree to which, ah, sorry, this chair keeps, okay. There's a degree to which doing some of the things that have been recommended in this presentation would help. So I'll just repeat them again, um, just for the benefit of, um colleagues so first is identifying the problem identifying the root cause figuring out who the populations that could benefit from your 
um, intervention and those who can be considered as stakeholders are um, being clear about what your solution is, what your specific solution is, and recognizing that your solution can have challenges. So that level is one. The other level is the questions about having systems, structures, what have you, right stuff. Uh, let me tell you why it's important because uh, often there are specific things that a donor would be looking for. Like, first of all, does this organization exist? You know, is it there? Does it exist? Does it have a legal registration? Does it have, you know, all of those things? But also that they want to be clear that the problem that you're dealing with is a problem that is actually relevant from their strategy point of view that, you know, engaging with you allows them to be able to um, discuss a potential solution to the problem in a particular place with you and that it's not a fishing exercise. Uh, because you, we, I mean, we all have busy days. I professor, I imagine that you have actually even a much more busy schedule than some of us in the NGO spectrum because you teach, you do research, you have to also max scripts and deal with students and supervise, you know, projects, what have you. So you can you can understand that people who work in donor organizations also have finite amount of time, which means that every time there's choice making involved in both deciding who to meet, who not to meet, who to talk to, who not to talk to, you know, um, at the minimum, you should get a response to your email. So if you're, if you're not getting responses to your email, that should not be the case. You know, even if it's if to say that, you know, we don't want to fund you, but some donors are also explicit to say that we would not be able to respond to all emails because of the volume that we get. So I think looking at those caveats also matters. But just to say that access really depends on your positioning. Access to some degree is about who you are, what you represent, what kind of work you're doing, and what you say about the work that you're doing. So, um, but two tips that I would offer, and I know I've been doing two points mostly in this presentation. It's it's not intentional. They just happen to be two, two points. So two things that I would mention. One is when you first reach out to a donor, I personally think that the first thing you talk about should not be money. Because sometimes you get letters that say, oh, we're looking for sponsorship to the tune of x amount of money and you know but then the, the document doesn't contain enough information about the organization's work so actually the place to start is that you want to have a meeting to learn about the organization's work and to also share about your own work you know that's how i would reach out to other organizations and i recognize that i have advantage because i work for a donor but you know the principle is similar that when you reach out the first time, you really just want to learn and share, you know. So that's the first tip that I would offer. The second tip that I would offer is, you know, that the people who work in donor organizations are human beings, you know, and they circulate just like the rest of us. So the question is, where would you find them without hindrance? So I would be on the lookout for conferences where they're likely to speak, for events like this where they're likely to be present, and to really kind of figure out a way to build a initial contact, you know, with them. You know, I remember in my twenties, you know, leading an NGO, we, we used to run around international conferences looking for all the UN and donor people to say, oh, my name is, you know, like unsolicited, you just tell them stories about your life and your work and your organization. And it's their, it's their work to listen to you and they would not, you know, be rude and just walk away. And then, if you strike the right chord, you know, you, you yourself can tell if a relationship will work out, right? And then you can follow up and have, um, so really being able to network in the places where these people are present, you know, is important. I don't know, you know, for a fact that you can just show up at an organization's office and try to meet someone. It may work sometimes, but in an organization where there is a process to clear you to enter, you need to actually have an appointment with someone. So there's a good chance they won't let you in. Finally, I, I want to say that Ford works in two areas. You know, I, maybe I should have said a little bit of that. We work in two areas in Nigeria. We work on 
natural resources governance, the bulk of it is focused on elevating community voice and participation in um, decision making around resource allocation, resource sharing um, in resource producing areas. You know, so if you think about a place like the Niger Delta, you know, there um, resources go back to communities by virtue of, you know, funds go back to communities by, by virtue of their being resource producing. So in some sense, um, uh, our work is focused on you know, really elevating the voices of the marginal groups in those decision-making processes. And then the other angle of it is really plugging the holes that result in leakages of funds you know, that are meant to benefit communities. So we work partly on uh, preventing illicit financial flows. A part of our work is focused also on energy transition, really a new area of work that we're looking at and kind of exploring the thinking about, you know, the energy transition and what it means for um, communities that are dependent on uh, funds from fossil fuels for their survival. Um, our second area of work is called gender, racial and ethnic justice. And, you know, to be just brief, it focuses on preventing gender-based violence that you know that women experience across Nigeria and all of West Africa. So those are the kind of two core areas that we work. I see that the gentleman is talking about milestones. I think you know I, it just goes back to the point that I was making. Like, how do you signal that you have the capacity to do this work? Um, and and in some sense, signaling that you have the capacity to do the work may mean that some of the nitty gritty criteria are overlooked because when, when the donor looks at the big picture, your organization is well positioned to be able to do the work that is setting out to fund. So I know I've taken more than 10 minutes beyond the time that is allocated for this, but to say thank you to everyone, you know, for just allowing me to ramble along, you know, and just talk on and on and on. And thanks to ACT Foundation for inviting me. I think this is a, this is a really, interesting space and I hope that you know you would we would have another opportunity to continue this conversation about fundraising maybe spend some time looking at how do we raise funds locally but thanks everyone appreciate thank you so much as well for making the time I really appreciate it both of you um coming to share your knowledge your wealth of experience and insights on how um non-profits can um raise funds sustainably, but also um, from a donor perspective, some of the challenges that um, you have um, seen or the trends that you have noticed in this space. Um, also, thank you everyone um, for joining us uh, today. Um, we're only here because you're willing to listen to us, and so we're very grateful for you. Um, and we hope that you've um, gotten value for your time. We hope that you've learned uh, better ways to improve on your fundraising strategy. But just to officially take us out of um, today's session, I'd like to invite my colleague, Bibi, um, to give a closing remark um, as we leave. Thank you very much, Elo. Um, on behalf of the entire ACT Foundation family, I'd like to say a very big thank you to uh, Mr. Dabesaki. Uh, thank you for the honor of sharing from your wealth of experience. Um, a lot of insights have been shared here today by you and uh, by Professor Becky. Um, we're very hopeful that um, some of these things you take away, uh, go do some personal research on them, and then let's see you know, how things go from here. He had mentioned a lot of things. I like the fact that um, uh, Mr. Dabet Sakitu calls back to the basics on uh, understanding our why. Why do we actually exist? You know, do we have good understanding of the committees that we want to work with or that we're working with? Uh, do we even do a good analysis of the problems that we are finding so that the solutions that we're providing actually do align with the problems that we have found? Um, Mr. Dabesaki also touched on the fact that we need to understand our competencies, you know, and build them some more, understand our donors, understand what they want